All right. Well, good morning. Why don't you have a seat? Thanks for being here today. Uh, if you're a guest, my name's Trey Kelly. I'm the lead pastor here. Well, thank you. We're happy you're in the room. Uh, thanks for joining us online. Um, if you didn't hear, we had some technical issues this morning. And unfortunately, I tell you this because one of the casualties was my television. So, feel like I'm playing baseball without a glove, uh, football without a helmet. So, if you see me go for a screen today, because I've done it for a decade, just give me a little grace, because it's not there. But it actually was perfect for... The series we're in, if, you, if, you, if you've missed um, any of this series, we're in a series called, You Good? And the answer this morning is, I've been better. <laughs> no, nah, we're good, though. We're good. We were joking about this morning that, you know, if the, if the apostles could come in on a Sunday morning and hear us talking about, we don't have the TV. <laughs> apostles people were like, we never had a TV. So, I think... I think we'll be just fine this morning. Uh, but hey, if you are new and if you've missed any of this series, I'm going to highly encourage you, if you don't have it, grab our app, download that. It's a great way to stay connected with our church, but also it's a great way for you to go back and watch uh, what we've talked about. This is week three of the series, and um, I believe, um, as has happened every week, that if, if, you, if today's your first time, I think the Holy Spirit might touch your heart, open some things, and you might want to go back and see where we've been because the entire point of this series is for each of us to just give ourselves the permission to breathe, the permission to admit we might not be quite as good as we think we are. Um, the last few years have been tough. Um, and most people that I talk to, myself included, are struggling a little bit. Um, either with anxiety for the first time, uh, lack of motivation, things overwhelm, uh, inability to focus, just, just all those things. And so what we've been kind of opening each week with is just, just a reminder from us to you, this is a safe place to talk about it, okay? It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. But as we've been saying for the last few weeks, it's not okay to stay that way. And it's not okay to stay that way because we have a gracious, loving, heavenly Father that wants better for us they're not okay. And that's really what this series has been about. And it begins with the narratives we tell ourselves in our lives, with the stories we tell ourselves. We've been talking about that this in the entire series. Uh, specifically, one story we've all been telling, and I've been calling it the story of better. Uh, very simply, how do you finish this sentence? Life will be better once. And for the last few years, we all pretty much have the same story. Life will be better once things get back to normal because COVID messed everything up. And if you're like me, over the last year, as things have started to get back to normal, you've realized they didn't get better. And so what often we do is we go chasing another story. Well, if that didn't make it better, maybe... If I get a promotion at work, that'll make it better. Maybe if I start this new relationship, that'll make it better. Maybe if I end this relationship, that'll make it better. Maybe if I make some more money. Maybe if I truly get my finances in order. And all these stories continue to lead us down paths that bring us to today in a place where we're like, man, I, I just don't know what's going on. And what we've been talking about for the last few weeks is those stories are normal. Those stories are natural. Our brains are constantly telling us stories. It's how we make order out of chaos. We were designed for story. And the God of the universe has written a story that we can build our lives on, that we can center everything we do on. And it's something we say around our church a lot. It's the story of Jesus, that Jesus is the sole source of our soul satisfaction. That the beginning, the first step to solving literally whatever's wrong with any of us is a step towards Jesus. To not simply have him in our story, but to make him the center of our story. And so as we wrapped up week one of the series, we had a chance to make that decision. Many of you made that decision for the first time. 
Last week, we picked up right where we left off. All right, if we're going to decide to make Jesus the center of our story, how do we do it practically? What's the, what's the process that we have to follow? And Jesus, in his goodness and kindness, saw fit to record for us exactly what he asks us to do. And we read it last week. He said, come to me. Just simply come to me, all who are weary, and carry heavy burdens. See, this is where I need my television. <laughs> and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. What we learned last week is Jesus basically says, come to me with the struggles. Come to me with the burdens. Come to me with the issues that you carry. Come to me, lay them down. And as we learned last week, pick up something better. His yoke. His teachings. In essence, Jesus says, hey, come to me. Talk to me. Quit trying to do things your way and do them my way. Because my way is better. Because I know the future and you don't. We ended last week, if you were here, with a practice that we can all bring into our lives to learn how to speak to Jesus more clearly, more directly, more intimately. We learn how to pray a little bit. A very specific prayer where we got quiet with Jesus and we, we handed him our burdens and we promised to follow him. And I challenged you last week to continue to do that. And I know many of you did. And that's where I want to pick up today because if you did that, did it last Sunday, if you did it this week, or even if you you think about it now, when you bring your burdens to Jesus, when you name them, when you say them out loud, if you're like me or if you're like most people, you probably notice something. That most of the things we bring to Jesus, most of the burdens we have, most of the things that weigh us down are things that we were never designed to carry in the first place. They're external things. They're things beyond our control. They're residual things we're carrying from the past. Uh, one of the books I read this summer to kind of get ready for the series um, is a book called Resilient. It was written by a Christian author named John Eldridge. It's a fantastic book. I, I will highly recommend it. And near the beginning of the book, he, he makes a statement that I'm curious if it resonates with you as much as it resonated with me. Here's what he said. He said, we burn through so much of our emotional, mental, and spiritual energy simply through worry, anger, being generally unsettled, and by taking in too much of the overwhelming news of the world. Do not raise your hand. (laughs) But how many of you can relate to what our good friend Mr. Eldridge has to say? We spend so much time, so much energy, we burn on anger, on worry, on being overwhelmed by news of the world. And Jesus would say, those are all burdens. Those are all things you are carrying, and they are weighing you down. They're depleting. No wonder you feel tired. No wonder you feel overwhelmed. You believe you're supposed to solve the world's problems. And Jesus is like, That's sweet and all, but you can't. And I never asked you to do it. And so what I want to do as we wrap up this series, this week and next week, is I want us to lean back into Jesus' teaching, lean back into Jesus' load, to to yearn his process for how we're to handle what I consider the two biggest issues in that quote, worry and anger. The anxiety we carry and the anger we carry. This week we're going to deal with worry and anxiety. Next week we will end the series with anger. So if that makes you mad, come back next week. (laughs) Because last week we learned, bring our issues to Jesus, lay them at his feet, and follow his teaching. Well, wouldn't you know it? Jesus is abundantly clear when he talks about worry. In Matthew chapter 6, he teaches us about worry. And the very first thing he says is, I tell you not to worry. Don't do it. I tell you, hey, don't worry. And I know sometimes we hear that and we're like, bro, come on, Jesus. That's easy for you to say. 
but you don't know my life. You don't know what's going on. But we forget something that we inherently understand, especially if you're a parent, but we forget it when Jesus says it. Do you know who actually has the authority to tell you not to worry? The person who's in charge. Parents, where do you get the authority to tell your children not to be scared of the monsters under their bed? You get the authority from being a grown adult human being who knows monsters don't exist. And so you with full authority can say, don't worry. You don't have to worry. I promise. You don't have to worry. Why? Because you know what they don't. You know there's no monsters under their bed. When you're on an airplane and it starts getting a little bumpy, bumpy. (laughs) Do you feel better when the person sitting beside you says, don't worry, it's nothing? No! No! You're like, shut up. You know nothing of the situation, and you might make it worse. But when the pilot comes on, uh, hello, everybody. Just want to let you know that a uh, little bumpy, a little turbulence, but everything's going to be okay. And you're like, oh, okay. Now, why? Why does that voice have more authority in your life? Because he's flying the plane, right? Because he's up there. Because he's in charge. See, what Jesus says, I tell you not to worry about things. He's not pointing a finger. He's not saying what's wrong with you. He's saying, I'm in charge. I'm flying the plane. I have looked under the bed. There's no monsters. So it's not just some random person telling you not to worry. It's me, Jesus, the king of the universe, telling you not to worry. So he says, I'll tell you, don't worry. A few verses later, he says, do not worry about these things. What are these things? All things. Anything that you actually can't take a step to solve, he says, don't worry about it. Because as we learned last week, he's in charge. He's carrying it. And if there's a step that he wants you to take for that day, he'll inform you of that step. And then it is up to you to take that step. For example, if you are in your house and there's a storm, it's been raining for hours, and you notice water on your ceiling, don't pray about that. (laughs) I mean, you can pray if you want, but it's pretty clear. I got a leak. I need to do something about it. Okay? If you see that water and you go, oh, no, there's water, that's not worry. That's a step you can take. Now, if every time it rains, you run around your house saying, please don't leak, please don't leak, please don't leak, and there's never been a leak, that's worry. And that's exhausting. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, guys, I am in charge of your life, and if you'll let me, I will alert you to things that are happening, and when things happen that are beyond your control, I will help, I promise. But I'm in charge. You don't have to worry about these things. And then a few verses later, he says it one more time. Don't worry. Three times. Three times he's encouraging us. Hey, you don't have to worry because I am in charge. But you know what happens if you tell someone, don't do something, right? Like if I were to tell you right now, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not. Seriously, do not. Do not think about a pink elephant. Do not do it. You're all thinking about pink elephants. That's all you're doing. And on the surface, it could sound like that's what Jesus did. That he just says, hey, don't worry. But now remember last week he says, take my yoke, follow my teaching. See, God's Holy Spirit did a really cool thing with Jesus and his teachings. Maybe you know the story. When Jesus died on the cross, he came back to life. And then he spent around 40 days with his disciples, getting them ready. And then he gave them a final charge. You go change the world. I'm going to go back to heaven. I'm going to send someone who can help you. He sent something called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what guides them, is what guides us, is what speaks to us, is how we communicate with God. And God's Holy Spirit led the first generation of men that were the followers of Jesus to not just take his message. His Holy Spirit continued to deliver his message to them. And these men wrote the biographies we have of Jesus' life. They wrote the history we have of the early church called the Book of Acts. And they wrote letters. 
They wrote letters to Christians to explain to them how to take up the yoke Jesus was talking about. And one of those men was this guy named Paul. He wrote about half of what we call the New Testament. And in his letter to the church at Philippi, it's as if he picks up where Jesus leaves off. And he writes the process for worry. And he begins the same way Jesus says. He says, hey, don't worry about anything. And again, you hear that, you're like, Paul, okay, okay. I know I'm not supposed to worry about anything, but man, it's kind of hard if you just say don't worry about anything because then when I do worry, I feel bad about myself. And Paul's like, well, keep reading. I'm not done yet. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And because we've read what Jesus said in the book of Matthew last week, we know all Paul's doing is connecting the dots here about worry. Because last week Jesus said, bring me your burdens, lay them down, and I'll teach you. What Paul is saying is specifically when you feel worry, when you feel anxiety, bring it to Jesus and talk about it. See, Paul was writing this letter to the Philippians before Matthew had written his biography of Jesus' life. And so this is actually the first recorded teaching we have about how to deal with worry, how to deal with with anxiety, and it literally goes back to what Jesus said. Hey, when you feel anxious, when you feel worried, don't feel like you have to carry that. It's not on you. Bring it to Jesus. Bring him your burdens. Lay it at his feet. That's what Paul says. He says, tell God what you need. What that means is you go to God and say, hey, man, I am really anxious about my help. I'm really nervous about my help. Hey, God, I've got a meeting this afternoon, and I'm really nervous about it. Hey, God, my child just got their license. The world should be nervous about it. (laughs) Or, or, I won't speak for you. I'll just speak for me. God, I'm nervous, and I don't know why. God, I wake up nervous. I wake up anxious. I wake up heavy, and I don't know why. See, it's all part of that process we learned last week of laying things down, bringing them to Jesus, and talking about them. But Paul goes one step further. He gives us a second step, and then he's going to actually give us a process later on. But he gives us this second step. He says, hey, go to God. He says, tell him what you need. And then he says, and thank him for all he's done. Now, see, that's new. That's not a part of the process we knew yet. What he's saying is, okay, when you experience anxiety, when you worry, when you have fears, get down, get quiet, talk to Jesus, put them all out on the table, lay them out, tell him exactly what's going on. Oh, and while you're there, also spend some time thanking him for what he's done before. So, hey, Jesus, I've got a meeting coming up. Hey, Jesus, I've got a, I've got a deal coming up. Hey, Jesus, I've got a test coming up. And, man, I'm nervous because this presentation, closing this deal, it's like half my bonus for the year, and I'm nervous about it. Hey, I'm nervous about this test. It's half the grade for the semester, and I've heard lots of people fail it, and so I'm nervous about it, Jesus. I'm nervous. I'm going to ask you to help me. And while I'm here, I want to thank you because that last presentation I had, man, you really showed out. You gave favor they, were, they bought in before I walked into the room. Hey, God, that last test, as I studied, you brought everything back to memory. Thank you so much for your goodness last time. And then you'll start to realize, huh, yeah, you were really good last time. So, you know, I bet, I bet, you know, since you love me and all, I bet you'll be really good this time, too. <sighs> Okay, yeah, you really do love me. Thanks, Jesus. Maybe this is why you say I shouldn't worry. I should just talk to you. And I should thank you for what you've done before, and I'll remember who you are. And so what Paul says is, as we learn to do that, as we learn to come to Jesus, as we learn to lay our burdens down, as we learn to say, hey, this is what I'm worried about, hey, thank you, Jesus, thank you for what you've done in the past. As we do those things, look what Paul promises. He says, then, then... After we do those things, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. I grew up in church. 
And the translation we used to use called that the peace that passes understanding. And I love it. Because it's a peace that is promised regardless of our circumstances. If you only have peace when your circumstances demand it, that is your peace. If you want peace regardless of circumstances, follow this process. Because that is what Jesus promises. And not only that, it's how our bodies were designed. One of my favorite things to do in the world is to point out how God created our bodies and science has proven that his methods work. And I've actually shared this before when, I, when, I, when I've taught on this passage because I stumbled upon a book years ago. It was actually an article I read about this neuroscientist. His name is Dr. Alex Korb, and he's a neuroscientist at UCLA. And he wrote a book called The Upward Spiral. And in it, he details basically how Paul's instructions work. Now, Dr. Korb didn't know he was proving Paul. I did that for him. But uh, he didn't set out to prove that what Paul said worked, but uh, it does. Because one of the experiments Dr. Korb set up, because he was studying emotions and the way humans um, experience emotions. And so uh, he brought these people in, and he has these, um, uh, these, these measurements that can measure the activity in uh, the amygdala, which is the emotional response center of the brain. And so he brought these people in, and what he would do is he would show them pictures of other people experiencing an emotion. All right, so he'd show them a picture of someone who was sad. And normal people who are empathetic by nature, when you see someone who is sad, the human response is to mirror and match that emotion. It's called attunement, and it's it's pretty normal. Most normal, healthy people will do that. And so when they look at the picture of sad, he could measure the, the emotional response center, and he could see that they began to feel sad. And he could actually see the degree, the severity, like on a scale of 1 to 10, he could see how strong they were experiencing the emotion. And for most people, it was a pretty strong emotion. You know, it, it's, it's the way you react when you see, um, you know, like a commercial. Or um, for me, it's the way I react when I see any of the um, social media viral videos of soldiers surprising their kids. I cry 100% of the time. Like, it is, it is automatic reaction. Stop the day for 10 minutes. Watch the video. Cry. Move on with your life, okay? I don't know those people. I don't know where they live. I know nothing about it. But it's a, it's a human response. And so he measured the responses. And by accident, he noticed something because he would ask them to label the emotion. Hey, what are you, what are you feeling? And so if the picture was sad and they started feeling sad, they would say, I'm feeling sad. And consistently, he discovered something amazing when the people said it out loud. No one had ever, ever seen this before. Let me read it to you. Here's what he said. He said, when they were asked to name the emotion, the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex activated and reduced the emotional amygdala reactivity. Exactly, right? Um, (laughs) You get my point. Fantastic. Let's move on. No, here's what he said. In other words... Consciously recognizing the emotions reduced their impact. Scientifically studied, consciously bringing to mind the emotion. Naming the emotion reduced the feeling, the impact of the emotion. What does Paul tell us to do? Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Say the words. Tell God, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling worried. And what science has discovered is you are wired for that to work. You are wired for that to lessen the emotional reactivity, the emotional experience you're having in that moment. But wait, there's more. (laughs) Both parts of Paul's plan work. Because another part of the experiment, a separate experiment, uh, same thing, uh, studying the, the brain, studying the centers, And this was focused on how to cheer people up, how to put people in better moods. And one of the tests they ran was on gratitude. And they just literally had people come in, and they said, list all the things you're thankful for. And they studied something. uh, They studied it. They discovered something amazing. Here's what it says. Sorry, let me read it to you. One powerful effect of gratitude is that it can boost serotonin. 
Now, if you aren't familiar with the brain, let me just very quickly, if you're familiar with Prozac, it's an anti-anxiety medication, one of the things Prozac does is boost the serotonin levels in the brain. Literally, boosting serotonin levels is known to reduce anxiety. And what Dr. Korb discovered is by simply thinking about what we're grateful for, serotonin levels in our brains are boosted. And here's his conclusion. Watch this. Trying to think of things you're grateful for forces you to focus on the positive aspects of your life. This simple act increases serotonin production in the anterior cingulate cortex. Whatever. (laughs) What it means is God's way works. Who knew? It's almost like God is real. But I bring that to us today to remind us of the goodness of our God. To remind us that he designed us on purpose. And when he gives us instructions, when he says, lay your burdens down, take my teaching, take my yoke, he's speaking as one in charge. In fact, he's speaking as the creator. He's saying, not only am I in charge of you, I designed you. I know everything that's going to work for you. I know what's going to hurt you. I know what's going to help you. I know it's scary, but you can trust me. You really can. And when you experience anxiety, when you experience worry, know that there's a process you can follow. You can come to me. You can lay it down. You can seek to be grateful, and you can feel better in that moment. But because God is so good, he goes beyond the moment. Let me show you what Paul says next. Paul tells us that his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So what he's saying is not only can you experience peace when you feel anxiety, when you feel worry, you can live in peace. It can go from being a momentary moment, just just a pause in your day of, oh, that feels good, and then back on the hamster wheel of worry, he's saying, no, 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 no. If you continue to follow me as you live in Christ Jesus, as you day by day, moment by moment, continue to come to him, continue to follow him, continue to trust in his teachings, that peace you so desperately desire can become a part of your daily existence. But for that, we have to continue to walk with Jesus. And that's what Paul says next. He makes this great promise. And then he continues. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. And I love this. Because for a lot of us, the reason we struggle with worry, the reason we struggle with anxiety, it's our thoughts. They're broken. And we need to fix them. But that's not really what he means when he says fix your thoughts there. When, he, when Paul says, fix your thoughts, he means attach your thoughts. Anchor your thoughts. Plant your thoughts. Plant your mind in something bigger and better and stronger than you. Here's what he says. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You know what he's really saying? Think about Jesus. Think about who he is. Think about what he wants. Now, let's tie this back to worry. Let's tie this back to anxiety. See, what Paul is saying is we need to attach our thoughts to Jesus. What that inherently means is they're currently attached to something else. And part of our job as we live in Christ is to go to Jesus and to give him permission to help us investigate the inputs of our life. Did you know you needed to investigate the inputs? That our job is not to just blindly receive whatever the world throws at us, especially if we live with worry, if we live with anxiety. What Paul is saying is, hey, 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 no, no, no. You got to fix your thoughts. You got to attach your thoughts. That means you've got to investigate the inputs that are coming in. And look, I can't speak to the inputs in your life. All I can do here is tell you about mine. 
one of the inputs that I discovered was causing massive amounts of worry, massive amounts of anxiety, was my daily consumption of cable news. And I know some of you, I lose you the second I say it, but I'm begging you, I'm begging you to give me three minutes on this. I'm begging you. Because what God opened my eyes to and what is so apparent and what will change your life is to simply step back and investigate that input. And I'm not talking about one side of cable news. I'm not talking about the other side of cable news. I'm talking about all cable news. I'm talking about all radio talk shows. I'm talking about anybody that makes money off your eyeballs or your ears. You knew that, right? Cable news is a for-profit business. Talk radio is a for-profit business. And the more you watch, the more they can charge advertisers, and the richer they get. That's why they have like three private planes. I'm not saying that's bad. Capitalism is fantastic. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying we miss something. When we consume cable news, political news, talk radio news, when we consume it to the point that it affects how we feel about ourselves, it affects how we feel about our brother and our sister, it affects how we feel about the world, we have to step back and understand what is happening. They don't make money if you turn them off. So you know what that means? That means they have to keep you scared. They do. They have to keep you worried. They have to make you believe that the next segment they're going to say is the most important thing you've ever heard. And if you don't hear it, your grandkids are going to suffer. That the world's going to fall apart. But have you noticed at the end of that segment, then the next segment is the most important thing they've ever had to say and you can't miss it. And if you miss it, your grandkids are going to die. And then the next segment actually, not only that, the government's going to come and they're going to kick down your door and they're going to arrest you. For-profit news will never tell you everything's okay. For-profit news will never tell you. You know what? Today, the other side, they did a good job. You know what? Got to give it to them today. They'll never tell you that. They'll never say, hey, you know what, folks? I think it's going to be a pretty light week. Why don't you take the week off? Why don't you go to the beach? We'll talk next week. (laughs) Ever. Because then they lose money. And all of them, left, right, center, that's what they care about. I promise, it's not you. Because if they cared about you and they cared about your mental health, they from time to time would tell you some good news. They would say, you know what, things are going pretty well today. You know what, we're good. But they don't. And I don't don't blame them. They're making money. But if it's controlling your life, you got to investigate your inputs and turn it off. And you know what happens when you turn it off? The world keeps spinning. (laughs) But your soul gets a little lighter. (sighs) Another input I had to investigate and deal with for my life are the devices we carry. For me, it was mainly a phone and an Apple Watch. And here's what I discovered about the phone and the Apple Watch. They are bad news machines. (laughs) They are. They don't always deliver bad news. In fact, rarely do they actually deliver bad news, but 100% of the bad news I get, I get through those devices. Specifically, my Apple Watch. I had it set to silent, but it would vibrate any time I would get a notification. I'd probably get 100 notifications a day. So 700 a week. Of those 700 notifications a week, you know how many were actually bad news? 
Like maybe one a week, maybe one every other week. But do you know how many of those my body felt as bad news? 700. Because it could have been. And so I realized I was getting a little hit of anxiety 700 times a day. So you know what I did? I stopped wearing my Apple Watch. I don't wear it anymore. I set my phone to do not disturb, wait for it, when I didn't want to be disturbed. (laughs) Guys, I'm telling you, my day-to-day anxiety level plummeted. And there was nothing to pray about. I had to investigate my inputs. And I had to eliminate what was coming in. Because it was causing problems. Because it was trying to make me own things my Savior didn't design me to own. So if you struggle with anxiety, with worry, and you would say it's chronic, why don't you and Jesus spend some time investigating your inputs? And compare them to that list. Because that's the list he compares it to. And if your inputs aren't honorable and true and pure and lovely and honorable and excellent and worthy, consider eliminating them. Now, another way that we need to fix our thoughts, that we need to attach them to truth, is to recognize sometimes the things that happened to us in the past get lodged in our brain in the present and will affect our future. We talked about this a little last week. I'd say most of us have hurts from the past, things that have happened to us, sin that was perpetrated on us. It still affects our present. And it mainly happens in in two ways. One, because our brain doesn't know how to process it, we constantly relive it. We find ourselves in circumstances that remind us of it. And literally, our nervous system, because it's designed to protect us, activates. Or sometimes, with the things that have happened to us in the past, what our brain does is, in order to protect us, we live in a state of hypervigilance. Meaning we are constantly on guard so that we don't get hurt again. And both of those things, while helpful in the moment, contribute significantly to anxiety. And what I've discovered is that with the help of a professional counselor, Jesus can heal those things. What a professional counselor helped me do was to go back to that event to identify it, taught me some practices to kind of help shake it free. And essentially what happened was she helped me stamp Jesus on that event to process it through the eyes of Jesus, to live through the victory of Jesus, to have the heart of Jesus in the moment, to apply what Jesus would say in the situation, not what others said in the situation. And it set me free. And I would go so far as to say, if anxiety is a daily part of your life, if it is a consistent struggle that you can't necessarily pinpoint, I think the odds are very high that it's something from your past. And I know that may sound scary, but I hope it sounds encouraging. Because if it's something from your past, that means you're halfway there because you've identified the problem. The problem now is we don't know what's wrong. But when we discover what's happened to us, we can go to professionals who can help. And if that's you, we want to help today. As we've said throughout the series, we have people in our blue room who want to talk to you, to direct you to resources. Because let me be very clear, I am not that resource for you. I'm a pastor. My job is to teach you and to share what's happened to me. I'm not a trained uh, medical professional. I'm not a licensed professional counselor. Like, if, if you had a heart blockage, you would not come to me to fix it, right? <laughs> I got plenty of buddies who can help you out. But you would not want me to fix The same is happening if there are things from your past that are haunting your present. I love you and I'll pray for you. But I want to guide you to a professional who can help set you free. 
Because when we take those steps, when we come to Jesus, look at what Paul says at the end. He says, hey, guys, keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you've heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. That's a promise. That's a promise that this process works. This process was designed with your unique wiring in mind, and this is a process that can set you free. You can live set free from chronic anxiety. I'm living proof. And it begins, as we've begun every time, with a better story. The story that Jesus is the sole source of our soul satisfaction. And when we come to Jesus, when we start with Jesus, when we bring our burdens to Jesus, when it comes to worry and anxiety, he gives us a plan. Number one, tell him your worries. Name them. Say them out loud. Second, thank him for his blessings. Every time we go for help, we thank him for what he's done in the past because he's able to turn our request for help into a moment of hope. Oh, yeah, you helped me before. I believe you'll help me again. And it changes our way of thinking. But it doesn't stop there. We tell him our worries. We thank him for his blessing. Then lastly, we have to take steps to fix our thoughts. We have to take steps to investigate the inputs. We have to take steps to be open before God to say, you know what? There's some stuff that happened to me, and it's still affecting my life. And, and I would really love to talk to a professional about that to see if I can get some help. Because you can But we have to step. Why? Because that's what Jesus leads us to do. If our thoughts aren't daily attached to him, if they're attached to something else, sometimes we need a professional to help us learn how to disattach from the past and reattach to Jesus. And so wherever you are today, know that there is hope. Healing is fully and completely available. We do not have to live this way. Why? Because Jesus really is the sole source of our soul satisfaction. And he's given us his yoke. He's giving us his teachings. And he says, just trust me. Just follow me. So one question, and we're done. What step does he want you to take today? Do you need to tell him your worries? Do you need to spend some time being thankful? Before he's done, or is it possible that we need to go beyond that? That we need to take some steps to fix our thoughts, to make sure we're attaching them daily to the creator of the universe. Because when we do his words, we live in peace. That is the promise for each of us. And as your pastor, I just don't want you to settle for anything less than God's absolute best for your life. And that's why we're here to help. So I pray God's wisdom and courage over you as you take the steps he needs you to take today to live the life he created you to live. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Father, we're just so grateful. We're grateful for your son. We're grateful for the men you saw fit to deliver your word to. We're thankful that it was preserved for thousands of years and we can read it, we can apply it, and it'll change our life. (sighs) Father, just bring to mind all the thoughts we've attached to. Everywhere we fixed our thoughts and how it's affecting our lives. And Father, walk us through the process. Let us investigate inputs. Let us bring our past hurts to a professional so you can truly begin to set us free to attach our thoughts to you so that we can live the life you created us to live. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.